I just want to give the legal disclaimer that all of our offerings are open to accredited investors only. This is solely for educational purposes. So this is not an intent to sale. We are doing a deep dive into the PPM today with Mark Halpern. And um, it's going to be covering the Tempo Advantage Fund. So I wanted to um, share with you where to find the PPM on our website. We we have um, the Tempo Advantage Fund listed under funds right here on this tab. In fact, let me share a different screen real quick so that I can walk you through what you're gonna see on the website. So you go to the funds tab, you go to fun tempofunding.com obviously, go to the funds tab, drop down Tempo Advantage Fund, you click on it and the page will pop up. There is a lot of information. I encourage you to watch this video. It gives the background and tells about how we got to this point in the economy with commercial real estate. Um, a lot of the answers are on this page, but if there are still questions that you have about the fund, um, don't hesitate to book a call with me and I'll answer any questions you have. Otherwise, um, if you are ready to start investing or you want to review the PPM, click on Start Investing Now. It'll take you to our investor portal where we, again, have the video and all the things. And we go in detail with um, the Tempo Advantage Fund Marketing Book, also the one-page overview. The PPM is here. Uh, uh, you can look at the operating agreement and any of our subscription documents just to get an idea of what you will be filling out. Um, so if you need help, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'll show you all of this information with you. Um, I'm happy to talk through it as well. So I am going back to my video where I was uh, gonna share with you more information about Mark Halpern. Let's see, we got the legal disclaimer we went through and we went through the website. Here we are. So Dr. Mark Halpern is with us today. He, he actually is a chemist. Um, he has a very detail-oriented personality. And um, so he actually has uh, founded the organic or PTC Organics Inc. and has traveled across the world doing all kinds of big things with industri industrial labs and creating different compounds. Um, I don't know too much about that stuff, but I'm sure if you have any questions, reach out to him. He is also an author and um, co-authored the book, We Buy Houses Sometimes, and he does mentoring and training. As you can see here on the screen, he's got the Deep Due Diligence logo. That is actually part of the Left Field Investor Group. If you haven't heard about it, check it out. It's a really cool forum where investors get together and they talk through a lot of different topics. But um, Mark created a group that does deep due diligence. Um, that's what the DDD stands for. And they dive into the PPMs and all of the different um, marketing information that different operators and um syndicators provide and so they can do their research together and understand better what they're investing in. He also founded the Part-Time Investors Club. Uh, is it a club or a group or what is that, Mark? Do you teach classes? Oh, I can't yeah, hear you. Are you? Oh, uh, oh, can I, you hear me okay now? I can hear you now, yeah. Uh, okay, wow, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I teach a, a variety of classes. Uh, I, I have classes for Going from a, a poverty level to a credit investor, and then from a credit investor forward, I've got I've got uh, courses on happiness. I've got courses on face transcatalysis. I've done my two day boot camp uh, fifty eight times in the United States, Europe, and Asia. But I don't want to bore everybody with all that kind of stuff. Okay, well, I will give you um, control of the screen then, and so you can start diving into the PPM for the Tempo Advantage Fund. Okay, very good. And let's just go here. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. So yes, uh, Diana, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Uh, by the way, I will be at uh, the uh, in Indianapolis on the, the June uh, 3rd to 5th. So I'm looking forward to seeing whoever uh, might be there. I think that that'll be really good. 
Um, and just to, well, the topic we're talking about, or we, we were, we agreed to talk about was how to evaluate a private placement offering. And then, I don't know, four or five days ago, when we got back from a, a best ever conference. I said, Hey, maybe I can use uh, your, um, you know, the, the tempo advantage, as uh, uh, PPM uh, to, to, uh, to evaluate it or to, you know, to start looking at it. And because I'm really good at doing things in the last minute, I did not open it up until a little bit less than 24 hours ago. So everything you're going to see here uh, is is really uh, uh, very very recent, and and the reason why it's important is because uh, well you know I'm a part time investor just like most of the people probably uh, online here today, and the question is how do you evaluate so much information in such a short period of time? And I'm going to show you that it's uh, it's doable. Okay, and today uh, and the other thing which I said uh, probably three days ago or two days ago is. There's too much material here, so let's do a part one, and we'll have a part two at some point, maybe in the third quarter or fourth quarter. And today we're going to talk about demystifying risk factors in the PPM, where the P PPM means private placement memorandum. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a mini bio. This is going to be uh, a little bit strange here. So the first thing, I'm, I'm going to give you two characteristics of, uh, of myself. One, I'm a conserv conservative investor, and I, I hope hopefully a lot of you are, conser are conservative investors as well. Well, here's now the strange one. I engage in risky activities. Wait a second. How, how does that work? How can you be a conservative investor and engage in risky activities? Well, that's what I'm going to show you. So first, I'm going to tell you about the first risky activity that I, I've been engaging in for quite a while, and that's been marriage. I mean, why <laughs> would this be a risky activity? Well, because it's got a 45% failure rate, which is actually down from where it was a few years ago. But I mean, can you imagine doing private placements and having a 45% or real estate and having a 45% failure rate? That's not too good. So, uh, well, what are the results? Well, in my case, I've been married for 40, 43 years, uh, same wife uh, the whole time. And, and well, why? How was I, how were we able to achieve this? Well, uh, I performed deep due diligence on my wife uh, before we got married and, and she performed deep due diligence on me. We're not going to go into uh, in this lecture here about, uh, how we performed it, but then uh, how deep it went. So we, let's go on to the next one. Okay, so the next one is driving. I engage in driving. It's a very risky activity. How risky is it? 44,000 people died in the United States in, in 2023. And, and, and death is rather irreversible. So, I mean, that's that's a pretty big risk. Well, what are the results? Well, I'm, I'm giving the, the, the webinar here today. So obviously I haven't yet uh, died while driving. And why? Well, I learned the traffic rules before driving. So now what I want to do is I want to give you a little uh, test, a quiz, a high-risk driving uh, quiz, which uh, you, which you're going to think is going to be very easy, but you're going to see it's not as easy as you would think. Okay. Uh, and since um, people are not on, uh, everybody's on mute, except Deanna, uh, I won't ask for actual question, uh, the actual answers, but here we go. When you see this traffic light, do you A, stop, B, go, C, hit the gas, or D, hit the brakes? Well, hopefully you, uh, I won't even go into, it's a rhetorical question, you know the answer to that one. How about this traffic light? When you see this tra traffic light, do you stop, do you go, do you hit the gas or hit the brakes? Remember, driving is very risky. What about this one? When you see this traffic light, what do you do? Stop, go, hit the gas or hit the brakes. And now I'm gonna throw a curveball at you. These are actual traffic lights in a country where I drive uh, about once a year. What's going on here? And these traffic lights are not broken. There is a red light and a yellow light simultaneously. These are real traffic lights. Now, we're talking about managing risk. This is high-risk driving. If you go to this country and you do not know what this means, you could die. A bad decision. So actually driving is actually pretty risky. So um, I'm not going to embarrass Deanna because you probably haven't been to this particular country. Uh, have you ever seen uh, Have you ever seen a traffic light like that? I have not, and uh, I don't think I've driven in another country. I think I'm kind of lucky. Okay. But, well, okay. So, what this traffic light is is uh, in this particular country. Um, when uh, after the traffic light, but, but by the way, the the answer is C. Okay, the answer wow. is C. Uh, what you have to do though is you have to engage your gear. So, what happens is in this particular country, uh, after the red light happens, then before the green happens the yellow light goes on simultaneously with the red light um, before the green light comes on. Th this, is, this is about one second. It takes about a, one second. And what it is, uh, my, my speculation, I don't know the reasoning for sure, 
but this is uh, but I know that this was uh, well, it's a country that at the time when I first went there, uh, almost all cars were uh, were uh, shift uh, shift uh, you know gear shifts. Annual, so yeah. therefore, what what this what this is, and there's also a bunch of hills in this in this country, especially in one city. And so what this does is that so you have a red light, and the yellow light comes on pretty much to let you know. It's time to put your uh, to put your uh, your clutch in in gear and start uh, hitting the gas. So, uh, but why do I bring this up? We're talking about private placements here. Well, because you really have to know what you're doing. We're talking about risk management, and we're talking about high risk uh, activities. So, marriage is a high risk activity. Driving is a high risk activity, and, uh, and of course, and and how do you minimize the risk? Well, you perform deep due diligence. Private placement investing is high risk as well. Or is it? Well, we're going to talk about this. So here's just an example of something that came up. Uh, a, a number, actually, I'll just go to the next slide. Uh, a lot of, uh, pretty much everybody, including uh, Mike Zlotnick from Tempo Funds, uh, anticipated that interest rates were going to rise at some point. We all knew anybody that, that uh, was not brain dead understood in, in the late, two th uh, 20, late teens and even in 2020, 2021 to even 2022, that interest rates were going to rise. What we did not anticipate was the magnitude of this, uh, of the in increase of interest rates and the speed. So the combination of the magnitude and the pace really knocked a lot of people out. And this is for uh, especially apartment syndications that have adjustable interest rates and they need uh, rescue capital. Oh, I have a typo in there, don't I? Okay, so they they need uh, rescue capital. Of course, we're not supposed to use the, use the words rescue capital, so we're going to say recovery capital from now on. I'm going to try and do that, and in fact, that's going to be one of the one of the uh, targets of the Tempo Advantage Fund. So, uh, investing in private placements is is risky unless you perform your your deep due diligence, and there are a lot of different ways of managing risk in private placements. This is just uh, so we're we're going to talk about. Uh, risk management uh, most of today. But just to give you an idea, one of the ways which we're not gonna talk about today is diversification. And this is this is just happens to be a slide from uh, my course for the ultimate passive investor. And this just shows a, a 10 different projects that I have in my Roth and my self-directed Roth 401k. They're all, they're all private placements. And you can see some are meeting expectations, some are exceeding, some are below expectations, but overall, uh, when you have this kind of uh, diversification, ten projects in six sectors with uh, sorry with eight sectors with six sponsors, we're getting an average annual return of about twenty percent, which is pretty good, even though a few are below expectations. Okay, so we have a thing called we have a mindset called the triple D mindset. Triple D stands for deep due diligence, and what the triple D mindset is, it's an approach. Uh, it is it's a mindset. It's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a thought process. It's a philosophy that is based on uh, performing deep due diligence to improve investing investment performance. So what risk is, and a lot of different people have different uh, different definitions. My definition of risk is uh, is are factors that are unknown to the person making a decision at the moment of the decision. Now, again, that's that's just my my particular uh, definition. I've heard other definitions as well. But what happens is that let, let's say you have a private placement uh, investment, and let's say there are 50 different factors that could negatively affect the outcome. If you do regular due diligence, well, you might, you know, you might uh, find 30 of them or 35 of them. If you do deep due diligence, you might find 45 of them. Now, you're never going to be, be able to find 50 of them because like, who, who predicted a pandemic in, in 2018? Uh, I had an investment in uh, near Fort Dix in New Jersey in 1987. It was a private placement apartment complex, actually. Uh, now you have an idea how old I am. And um, uh, and it was going great. And it went bankrupt uh, before exit because the Soviet Union fell and you know peace broke out. And then uh, that affected uh, Fort Dix. And anyway, there, there was layoffs. Before you knew it, we went, it went bankrupt. So who in 1987 would have predicted the fall of the Soviet Union? It just, you know, there are certain things, or if an asteroid hits your apartment complex, you don't have asteroid insurance, who knows? So there's, you, you can't know 50 out of 50 factors that will negatively affect the outcome of a private placement, but you can, you can get pretty good at it. Now, the difference between identifying 30 or 35 factors and, four, and 45 factors is huge in terms of your probability of success. 
So the deeper due diligence that you perform, the higher the probability of success for private placement investing. So in our group, in our Triple D Mindset Club, and if you want to get more information, of course, there's a QR code up there. I'll show the QR code a few more times. We have a philosophy that if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, perform deep due diligence to confirm that it is indeed a duck. And here are just uh, some, some guidelines. This is, again, from, this, from, the, from the course. But just these are just some of the criteria or the or six of the several commandments of deep due diligence. Uh, deep due diligence always must be performed on two levels of management and operations. Understand and challenge every upside assumption. Understand and challenge every risk in the private placement. Understand and challenge every cell and every spreadsheet. Read every word of the PPM and the operating agreement. What what question did I ask that I that I not asked that I should have asked? So the, these are just some of the criteria that that we use to make sure that um, you know that we're doing proper uh, deep due diligence. So before we get into the uh, into the actual uh, risk management for the Tempo Fund and the Tempo Advantage Fund, I do have I have my own disclaimer. I and my company, part time investors, we do not provide investment advice, legal advice, accounting advice, psychological advice, any kind of financial advice or anything else. All I'm doing is sharing my uh, experience. And again, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not any of those licensed things. So you're going to have to perform your own deep due diligence. Uh, and uh, not only that, but you, you know, consult with licensed professionals in your state before doing anything. And uh, I do not endorse any opportunity or any syndicator, fund manager, or project sponsor. So I do not endorse uh, tempo management. I can just say that I've invested... 200 that my Roth uh, self-directed Roth 401k has invested $200,000 in three tempo projects, but that does not mean that I endorse because everybody's got to do their own deep due diligence. Okay. A little bit more about me. I am not a full-time investor. So when you see, I talk about things, it's not like, Oh, this is what I do for a living. Like we were, we were in BEC, right? Best ever comments last week in Salt Lake city. Jeremy roll was up there. Fantastic. I idolized the guy. Fantastic. But this is what he does. This is not what I do for a living. I haven't decided what I'll be when I grow up. I'm 70 years old. I do uh, chemistry. You can see my, I've, I've written seven books. You can see two of them on face transcatalysis. I've written two books on real estate. I've written a book on happiness. Why? Because. Um, so basically uh, I am a busy guy that does not uh, invest all my time in investing. I don't even invest most of my time in investing. And why is this important for this presentation? Because I perform deep due diligence in the real world. In fact, I only started looking at the PPM seriously less than 24 hours ago. Okay. Well, this PPM, yes. but you've done your deep due diligence on all your projects you've invested in over the time you started investing. So how long I, have you been a private placement investor, Mark? Well, uh, successfully or unsuccessfully. Uh, so <laughs> unsuccessfully since 1987, uh, obviously we had two that, uh, well, one of them went bankrupt. The other one, I invested in two private placements in 1987, uh, the one in Fort Dix, another one was in uh, scranton Wilkesbury, And that one <laughs> took 19 years until it returned capital and 29 years until we actually saw profit. And that was a, 5% compounded annual growth rate, not impressive. So um, it's uh, as a successful, I mean, doing it really, really well, I would say the last six years is is what I've been doing it like really, really well. But I've been I'm making quite a few investments and, and my portfolio is performing extremely well right now with the exception of, uh, I guess, three. But those three uh, do not wipe out the, uh, the you know, it, I, my, my portfolio is filled with, some overwhelmingly successful uh, private placement investments and, and and a few exits. So that's really good too. The exits are, you know, in the high 20s, the, the IRR, actually not the IRRs. The, actually one of them, had, it was an IRR of 53.3%, but I, I don't like IRR. I look at compounded annual, annual growth rate. It was 28.6%, which was a very good, but we have to look at IRRs because all the sponsors talk about IRRs. So I have to talk about IRRs. What can you do? So that's yeah. just, uh, that's, that's some of that. Well, time but, matters. Yeah. I've, and... I've been, yeah. yeah and I've okay. been investing in real estate for, for 20, I mean, seriously for 20 years. I was going to say time really does matter, but um, I'm like you, it, it really uh, depends on the project. And also I wanted to point out, you know, even in the good times, there are projects that don't do as planned, you know, there, there are some things that don't go as well as they hoped they would. So 
Um, you can't win them all, but at least diversify so you can win some of them, right? <laughs> Yeah, th that's exactly right. Actually, in the in the full day course that I give, which is called uh, High Return Private Placement Investing, Best Practices and Risk Management, I actually say literally a hundred times, a uh, hundred times during the entire time, you cannot eliminate risk, you can minimize risk, and you can manage risk. And another thing is that anybody who says they're batting a thousand in private placement investing is lying to themselves, lying to you, or lying to both, or they just don't have enough experience because they've done one or two and they, and and they've they've gotten lucky. But that doesn't mean that they that they fail. Actually, out of the, the private placements that I have right now, I do not expect any to fail. There are a few that are underperforming, but I do not expect any of them to fail. I do not expect to lose any money on any of the private placements that I have. Well, thanks for clarifying that. But then again, I could be wrong. I guess we'll find out. Okay, so what I'd like to go, do now is I'd just like to talk a bit about the process of private placement investing, because this will also help for part two when we schedule the part two of this. So there are several steps. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is uh, access private placement offerings. And for that, you have to develop relationships with capital raisers. What I do is I go to a lot of conferences. Uh, I go to the Best Ever Conference. That's the first time actually last week I went. But I go to Family Office Club, and I, th I think some of the people online today will be going there. And I meet with a lot of sponsors there. So that's good. And then once we have access to offerings, and I get about 300 per year, which, again, as a chemist, is a lot for private placement offerings, then I, I have to figure out a way to screen them. And one of the most important things that I do is, is I require a sponsor to send me a one-pager. If they don't send me a one-pager, we're done. They, 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 don't, they don't want my money. And that's okay. That's, they can get somebody else's money if they want. And, and typically, I'll invest maybe an hour or two a week going through one pagers, which is several of them. <laughs> I then attend webinars by Capital Raisers. I've attended uh, several of the webinars of, of, of Tempo. Uh, you know, Mike's uh, webinars are always uh, fantastic. And, and But these are also webinars that, um, that talk about the actual projects. So I do maybe <clears throat> one or two of those a week. And then after the one, one pager, after I attend a webinar, then I can decide if I want to proceed to due diligence. Then I ha have a private meeting with the sponsor, ask a bunch of, bunch of questions. At that point, usually, that's when I study the operating agreement and the PPM. And this could be five to 20 hours for each one as needed. But I only do it you know, as many times as I'm going to invest in a year. Um, in this case, um, I actually studied the PPM before I did any of this because uh, uh, I have to get this with this, uh, this webinar. So I had to, and I didn't study the entire PPM. You're going to see in a minute what parts I studied. Um, then after that, I have a private meeting number two with a sponsor to address crucial risks, which is really interesting because um, I started looking at this less than 24 hours ago and about 12 hours ago, well, about 13 hours ago, I wrote a letter to Deanna and Mike and I said, hey, there are six risks where I don't understand them. And uh, and then you guys responded pretty quickly, which is, which is really nice. And the reason why I'm, I'm going through this process is because I want to show you that if you're a part-time investor, uh, you have a primary occupation outside of real estate like I do, then this is the real world. I want to show you this, this is the way things uh, really happen. And it, so it, you can do this. Um, of course, you should always consult with a licensed attorney, a licensed accountant, a licensed financial advisor before making any decisions or taking any actions. But I'm just giving you an idea what, you know, the kind of stuff that, that I do. So we have this, uh, this the uh, second meeting with the sponsor to address crucial risks, sometimes even a third. And then if you like it, you subscribe, you wire the funds, and then you're in. And I don't want to get on this soapbox, but I also add the docs, the documents to my estate plan in a Dropbox folder so my wife and adult children can have access. God forbid something happens to me. Uh, all they have to do is make one phone call to a, um, a, a funeral home and agree for 23.7 milliseconds. And then uh, everything in my estate plan is set up in such a way that they can just take over and move on. And then, of course, after you invest, not much you can do, record reports, updates, um, attend webinars, enjoy the exits, repeat, and redeploy. So now let's get into this. So the first thing to do is the one-pager. And, uh, and the one-pager in this case, I think it's two pages. That's fine. A two-page, one-pager is just fine. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to – the first screen which I'm going to do is I'm going to say to myself, I'm going to look at the one-pager because the, I will oftentimes – invest 30 seconds on a one pager before I, I decided to discard it. And if it looks interesting, I might invest 60 seconds. So 
the first thing which I'm doing is I'm looking at my first screen is, does this meet my upside goals? And in this case, where are the upside goals? Well, a good one page is going to happen right there. And there they are. Uh, 8% uh, preferred return. That's that's income, which means there's money that you get on a regular basis once it starts. And then the 16 to 18%, that's the growth. That's usually, usually you get most of that in a big uh, chunk uh, at the end or, or maybe in portions later on. So that's the very first thing I'm looking for. If, if something, now in my particular case, so every investor is different. In my particular case, if something has an IRR of less than 15%, we're done. I don't even want to look at it. So that's why I don't look at uh, debt fund. There's a whole bunch of things, which I, I, sectors I don't even look at. So the 16 to 18%, that's attractive. Okay, that could be good. 8% preferred return, that's that's nice as well. So I can move forward. I also like the 80-20 performance split. That's the, <laughs> that's the percentage of ownership um, that the limited partners have. I'm a lim I'm a passive limited partner. And then uh, Tempo is the, uh, I don't know if you're called GP here, whatever you are, but uh, there's really strongly the, the, the fund manager. Okay, and then some additional background in, in the one pager. And what I like uh, in this particular, so the, you can see all the information. It's a minimum investment of quarter of a million, which uh, for my, in my case, I rarely write checks. I've written one check for quarter of a million. But uh, you can see the fund term. You can see all the information there. The management fee, two percent, very reasonable. Um, all, all the other good stuff. Uh, no depreciation, tax benefits. That's that's important to know. But one nice thing about is what I really like is I like this this um, this this graph here. This graphic is really good. So let's just explain a little bit about what's going on here. And again, remember, uh, I am not a representative of Tempo, and I'm not an expert in these sorts of things. And I don't get paid by Tempo or anything like this. This is just my novice understanding. Consult with the, with the licensed professionals uh, in your state to to understand these things properly. So here's my novice perception. So. Um, let's say there was an apartment complex and it was, uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I have one in mind. I just won't say the name of it. Uh, I invested, or my, my self-directed Roth 401k invested $100,000 in this particular uh, apartment complex in March of 2022. Not very good timing. That's exactly when the Fed started raising rates. Um, and they actually they raised rates from March of 2022 to July of 23. And in May of 22 is when they started raising at 75 basis points every time. That was incredible. And so we did not yet see the uh, what was going on uh, because we didn't know what the Fed was going to you know, have a historically uh, fast pace. So what happened is that there was variable rate financing for the apartment complex. And uh, I think I'm in preferred equity. Yes, I'm, I have preferred equity in this particular deal. The the rate so, so there was there was a mortgage very very large mortgage the, the first lien and it got to the point where the syndicator uh, couldn't operate uh, profitably without uh, some extra financing so that's where the mezzanine debt comes in mezzanine debt is that debt that comes in after the fact and it's debt it's not equity so it puts itself in second position after the senior debt. But but earlier positions than um, than the preferred equity or the common equity. So what what Tempo Advantage Fund is doing, in my novice understanding, without really asking too many questions yet, um, and just you know reading the information that I've seen, is Tempo Advantage Fund, and and Danny, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, is going to be providing uh, funding uh, to apartments indicators and other kinds of projects that need some, we're not going to use the word rescue capital, we'll say the word recovery capital. And then, um, and and there's some uh, some good risk management in here because there's, because the mezzanine debt is senior to the preferred equity, even though it's junior to the senior debt. And, right. but what's really nice, and I'll just go back to the one, one slide here. They must be getting some incredible interest rate because in commercial loans, you can get really high rates. So they're going to be giving us a, a limited partner investors 16 to 18% annual return and 8% preferred return. So they're getting some really high interest rate. If I remember correctly, I think it was about 21%, which I think 18%, 16, uh, I, th I think there's like 1% goes to, anyway, you, you'll be able to read all the, all the information in, in the, in the PPM and all that kind of stuff. But so the mezzanine debt, that's where the action is here. <laughs> That's that's what Tempo Advantage Fund is doing. 
in my novice, uh, non-actionable, non-qualified uh, understanding. So what we're going to do now is we're going to focus on, on the part of the of the, due, the deep due diligence that we do in private placement investing, forget about all the other commandments I talked about. We're going to talk about reading every word of the PPM and operating agreement. At least we're not going to, actually, we're not going to read every word in this, in this webinar, but we're going to go through something that's very important, which is the, the risks, uh, the risk factors of this. Now, this is really amazing. Really? Are we, do you expect me to read all of this? Are you out of your mind? This is the table of contents of the PPM of Tempo Advantage Fund. Well, that's nuts. Oh, and by the way, I do have to say that, um, so when you see the PPM, it says confidential on it. I got written permission from Mike Zlotnick of Tempo Fund Management to present this information, this presentation. Actually, I was not going to move forward unless I got that written permission. So I do have it. And Deanna hopefully will confirm that, that we are, yes. that I, I'm allowed to make this, this part of the presentation. Now, eventually, if I'm really going to be investing a quarter million dollars in this, I will read every word of all this. You know, I'm, I'm semi-literate. My reading comprehension skills are, you know, are, are acceptable. So and it's, it's written in English, some form of English that's actually somewhat readable. But what we're, we're, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at uh, really one thing. So uh, all I did in the last 24 hours, and not the whole 24 hours, I've been doing a lot of stuff. Those of you who have been you know, see me on Facebook. I mean, I've been doing things. So I did not dedicate the last 24 hours to this. I actually slept a little bit too. Um, but all I all I read so far of the PPM is a summary of the offering. There's a few pages. And then the seven pages of the risk factors uh, and disclosures, which of which there are 35 of them. And believe it or not, what we're going to do right now, get a cup of coffee. Oh, just before that. So we're going to go through all 35 risk factors which means if you do not have the patience to do this, then you it's it's a good time for you to, to leave right now. Um, but here's the thing. Why, why should we even have the patience and mental bandwidth for this deep due diligence? Well, because we want high returns and passive income and passive growth. It's not just passive income, it's passive growth as well. So this is the reason why we do this. And uh, it, it, in my never humble opinion, it's 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 worth the effort to invest a, a few hours figuring this stuff out because I want to benefit from these these high returns and I want it to be passive. You know, no no tenants, no contractors, no code officials. Uh, so it's pretty good. Okay, and just to give you an idea, this and uh, Deanna, you might recognize this from just before midnight last night. Maybe it was. I'm not sure when it was. Uh, I actually sent an email. So I started reading this less than 24 hours ago and I sent an email to Deanna and Mike and I said, hey, I don't understand these six risk factors. And then Mike uh, was, he actually sent me an answer. It was, so it's pretty cool. Okay, here we go. Um, the section number of the PPM that happens to, uh, of this particular PPM that's covering the risk factors is section eight. So for those of you who are doing rental real estate, uh, do not snicker when I say the word section eight. So this is section eight, number one. Okay, let's, let's start with this. So the first one is conflict of interest. What kind of conflicts are there? Well, um, Tempo Funds, uh, Mike, uh, myself, actually, uh, we are uh, preferred equity uh, shareholders and we're gonna be coming into the mezzanine debt. Well, there's, there's some conflict of interest there. As a matter of fact, the people in Tempo manage several funds. So there could be a potential conflict of interest. Let me just also mention, as we do risk, as we go through the risk factors, whenever I go through risk factors, I usually categorize them into one of three uh, groups. One, it's a deal breaker. Well, if it's a deal breaker, I'm done. Any single deal breaker, that's why it's called a deal breaker. And then if there's something I can't live with, then we're finished. Two is I can mitigate the risk. And three, I can live with the risk. So, yeah, do people at Tempo Growth Fund have some conflict of interest? Yes, they do. But I've known them for several years, put a bunch of my capital in there, met them personally, I have developed tr trust. So the way that I live with the conflict of interest is I simply, uh, it's KLT, no like and trust. I know like and trust Mike and the, and the team. So that's the way that I deal with it. If you don't, if you don't like or know or trust Mike or Deanna, well, then you should not. And so this is, this is the thing. If there's any deal breaker in here, if there's anything you don't you don't feel comfortable with, you should not invest. 
Okay, that's conf that's that's how I deal with conflict of interest. No market for membership units. Yeah, once once you put your quarter million dollars in, you're you're pretty much stuck there. Which means that you better perform your deep due diligence up front to make sure you're comfortable with this. So don't don't expect to for your your uh, your membership in units to be liquid. Investment risk. No it's just a general. Hey, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's no redemption built into a close ended fund. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and most private placements, that's the way it works. I mean, there are some certain cases where somebody can request, but not in this case, and we won't, won't go into too much. Um, investment risk, this is, well, hey, it's an investment. There's always risk. You can't eliminate risk. Uh, this 8.4, I always get a, a kick out of this one. It's in every PPM I've seen. Lack of operating history. Yes, Tempo Advantage Fund, when did you start it? In March or something like that? Is, April, is it a month actually, old? Actually, it's brand new. It's not even a month old. It's like two weeks old, maybe. Okay, it's, it's two weeks old. So it's no operating history. Oh my God. Who would ever invest something with that it has no operating history? Well, the answer is that the people are really expensive and have a great track record, but the but the, the lawyers say that they have to disclose that there's no no oper no, no operating history. Unproven revenue and profit potential. So I mean, again, it's been it's two weeks old, so it's not proven. Do I like the model? I like it, but hey, you have to like it. Okay, 8.6 is interesting. And I, I put it in blue to remind me to highlight it. This is one of the six questions that I asked uh, Mike and Deanna last night. Risk of the fund's inability to obtain financing. It's like, oh, excuse me, aren't we providing the financing, the mezzanine debt? I mean, each of us are putting in a quarter of a million dollars in this. We're providing, we're providing the financing. And so the answer is, there's always the possibility if the syndicate, if, if the, the project uh, that we are providing the mezzanine financing for, if it fails, then then this the debt holders are going to be foreclosing. So the senior debt holder and the mezzanine debt holder are going to be foreclosing. And that means that that the, the, the debt holders might own the property. So if they own the property, well, then we might have to have financing. The probability is low; it's not zero, and uh, and I'm going to guess that uh, all the other since I think this is the this is Tempo's first mezzanine uh, debt uh, fund. All the others actually had real real estate in it. Well, this is probably this is probably stuck from all the other uh, PPMs that you had there, and it was probably a copy and paste, as are some of the others. But a lot a lot of these are a copy and paste. So, but is there a chance that the fund might need finance? Like, there's a, there's a chance. It's 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 real low. Sorry, I'm not saying it's real though. I'm a chemist. Don't take investment advice from a chemist. I don't know what I'm talking about. In my personal, never humble, novice opinion, um, I do not deem the this risk as significant. But who am I? You need to talk with your lawyer, your CPA, and licensed financial advisor because they know what they're talking about. I don't know what I'm, what was the last time you took uh, financial advice from a chemist? Not not a good idea. Uh, Eight point seven is the same thing. Funds intend to use leverage. Well, do they really intend? That's, they could be in a situation that they could, and, and that's why the, the risk has to be there. Financial projections, I, lo I always love this one, financial projections. So we have a hard time. Hard, I can't even predict the past, for heaven's sakes, let alone predict the, the present or the future. So financial projections, of course, can always be wrong. Licensing requirements, well, there could be licensing requirements in the state, it could be federal. I mean, there's lending going on over here. So, uh, you know, what if they don't get the proper licensing? Uh, legal, tax, and regulatory risks, things can change. Regulations can, can, can change. Tax laws can change. Um, uh, eminent domain can happen. So there's all kinds of things that can happen. These are risks. And again, for me, uh, I do not consider this a, a, a big risk, but it's, it's always possible. 8.11 8 is uh, interesting. Tax liability may exceed cash distribution. So there are various ways this can happen. Again, I'm not a, a, an accountant. I'm just a chemist. Um, but I've seen K-1s. Uh, you can have phantom income. Uh, you can also have, well, this is cash. Um, yes, yeah, so you, you might have tax liabilities where uh, it shows uh, income at the end of the year. The K-1, that's the form that's that's used to report. Um, uh, all, anyway, I'm, really, I don't want to go into the whole thing K-1. Actually, Tempo sponsored, hosted a Lunch and Learn a really, really good one, maybe about a month ago or so. I watched it. It was really, really good. 
it was more than a month ago, but check out our YouTube if you would like to understand your K-1 better. Um, we did host someone, a uh, CPA, who actually went in depth about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Check out the YouTube if you want to attempt to understand the K-1. Uh, so trying to be accurate there. Um, K-1, box 20 has like 20 different options. So it's it's just crazy. But in any case, <laughs> you might get report. There might be a report on the K-1 of some tax liability. And, and if that distributing cash, you might have to pay tax on $12 or something. Uh, risk of audit of members' returns. Hey, if, if, the, if the fund gets audited, maybe they might have to audit your returns. Personally, I wouldn't worry about that one, but I'm not telling you what you should worry about. You, you need to worry about what you worry about. Uh, lack of capital. Let's say there's a really great opportunity and the fund, I think the fund maximum is 100 million, if I remember correctly. And let's say, hey, there's got to be something, you know, oh, and if I remember it correctly, because I, I did read it in the summary, that I think you cannot put in more than 10 million in any given project. So, um, you know, what, what if, um, you know, what if you need money and it's not, what, what the, the fund needs money to, to do a, a killer deal, but can't do it, there's lack of capital. 8.14 and 15 um, and 16 and 17 are all the same thing, which means uh, we don't have any control. Once we, once we invest as limited partners, we do not have any control. We're relying on, on other people to make the decision. So members must rely on the manager for management. Certain affiliates of the manager shall determine what's in the best interest. Voting rights are limited under the operating agreement. So we don't, we, once we send the money in, that's why we have to perform deep due diligence. That's why we have to perform. We have to be really comfortable before, before we invest. If you're not comfortable, don't invest. Limited operating reserves. Uh, basically, this means that there might be certain expenses the fund might have, and if all of a sudden there's no cash, they might have to do what's called a capital call. I, again, that's why you really need to know what the uh, track record is of the people that are are, are doing the fund. Okay, 8.19, 20, and 21. These all have to do with uh, real estate. So it is not, according to my novice understanding, I want to be very disclaiming the whole time, according to my novice understanding, Tempo uh, Advantage Fund has no intention of, of owning real estate. But nevertheless, <clears throat> it could own real estate. So if it does, then general economic conditions may affect the value and timing of the sale of the fund properties or the ability to refinance the fund properties. Uh, environmental hazardous property, that's always an issue. 8.21 is a little bit different. 8.21, because I finally read Mike's email in detail uh, five minutes before we got on here, so it, even though Tempo Advantage Fund, in my novice uh, understanding, is not going to uh, own real estate, in order to cash out all the money in the end, that real estate is going to have to be sold. So when that real so we don't know. So the real estate investments, are long term investments, may be difficult to sell in response to changing in economic conditions. So and, and this is a good reason why you want to ask the sponsors. I think in the PPM, I think every PPM I've ever seen it says. You are here. You here are hereby are given the right to ask any question you want, and and you should. And I do. I'm not. I'm not embarrassed. I, I ask questions, and this is this is one of those questions. If I wouldn't have asked Mike, I wouldn't have. Uh, I wouldn't have understood it. Which also means that just because I have good reading comprehension skills, that doesn't mean that I'm going to understand every single risk the first time that I I read it. That's why we ask questions. That's also why we join with others in in our deep due diligence. 8.22, there'll be competing demands on the officers of the, uh, the manager. They will not devote all of their attention. For example, some of them might sleep sometimes. Some of them might go on vacation. Some of them might be with their kids. They might watch television. And they also might be uh, managing five other funds. So we're not, you know, there'll be competing demands. None of the agreements with the manager were negotiated at arm's length. So there are several agreements in here because there's there are several um, uh, previous agreements uh, that were in place. No withdrawal rights. That's the same thing we talked about before. You can't say, oh, can I have my quarter million about, uh, dollars back? I, I sort of need it. I want to buy a jet ski. So you don't have that right. Phantom income, that's always that's an accounting thing, which I'm not going to go into here, but um, it sometimes appears on the K-1s. I remember the first few years in the 1987 when I was first doing that, and there, I was getting taxed on income of $200. So what's this for? I didn't get any money. Well, yeah, it's an accounting thing. Uh, the risk of being able to obtain financing. So that's 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 a risk that, you know, if we own the real estate, but I don't think that's going to happen. 
uh, risk of funds exceeding budgets. Again, the budgets are uh, the, the, the sponsors. The reason why I uh, never have a problem with that is because I know the sponsors and uh, I've, I've seen their track record and they're pretty good. The project may not perform as expected. Duh. Any project might not perform as expected. So again, if you can't live with that, don't invest. I I feel I can live with it. That's my, but that's my risk tolerance. Every person's gonna have a different risk tolerance. Allocation of income gain and loss and deduction. So that's there's a risk there because they might allocate it in the wrong way, which also ties into number thirty. There is no guarantee that the company's allocation of losses will be re respected by the IRS or any state taxing authorities, uh, which you really. Uh, if you're not into private placement investing yet, and I saw a few people who I know are not into it yet, uh, you're going to have to learn a lot about the K-1, You especially box one, box two, box five. You're going to have to learn what those things mean. And what if the accountant mischaracterizes those? Well, then you're going to have a little bit of problem, uh, uh, maybe a little problem with, with the IRS. And that happens all the time. Uh, not all the time. It, it happens from time to time. Uh, inability to redeem. We just talked about that before. Uh, it's just a, a another way of saying you can't uh, ask for your money back, withdrawal. Uh, 32, risk factors related to regulatory status under the Investment Company Act of 1940. The first time I saw this several years ago, I actually went and I looked what it was. And again, I'm not saying, again, don't trust the chemist, but what I'm saying is that I read it. And it looks like that if a fund hits $150 million or more, then it's subject to some intergalactic regulations by the intergalactic authorities, and you, you can go look that up. So I'm not too concerned about it. Although uh, Tempo uh, Advantage Fund has a max of 100 million, hey, they might hit it. Forward-looking statements, like I said before, I have a hard time predicting the past, let alone the future. Related party transactions, and and uh, and dependence on a key individual, which we sort of talked about before. So those are the 35. Uh, risks that are in the PPM. And I read them because they were in English and I had questions on six of them. I asked Mike and Deanna and that's what I did. So when I sort of look at this, um, after reading it, the offering summary and risk factors, the way I'm looking at it is, you know, I like the attractive annual return. I like the attractive 80-20 split. 8% PREF meets my personal income goals. It might not meet yours, in which case don't invest. I didn't see any deal breakers to my novice eye, there might be deal breakers for yours. For example, don't invest what you can't afford to lose. And I personally, I'm not saying you, but me, I can live with each risk, like the conflict of interest or lack of operating history, because I've got experience with these people and I'm satisfied. And then future projection and illiquidity, hey, I'm willing to live with those. But that doesn't mean that you should. Please don't take my word for it. You have to perform your own deep due diligence. So then there's some common sense assessments, uh, risk assessments. Hey, what if the borrower defaults? So I actually, the borrower, like the product, like, let's say it's an apartment syndication. Let's say they default on, on the loan. Okay, well, that means there's going to be a, uh, likely to be a foreclosure and, and the Tempo Advantage Fund might uh, own property. We now, can also here's something force with people. the sale. That's one of the Say things. that again, please. We can also force the sale of the property if they've defaulted. Ooh, oh, thank you for uh, clarifying that. You can force a sale. Very good. You got the, the ability. And even though you're in second position relative to the senior debt, you can still do that. Mm -hmm. Can senior debt wipe us out? No. Again, I don't want to give a qualified answer. I think for me, the answer is no. If if there's enough equity to cover. I mean, you never know. You know, the... the, the, the uh, well, that's part of the underwriting the, the, process. And uh, this is part of the underwriting process. It's actually written in our book, as an example for the first property that went into the fund. There has to be enough equity cushion as is already there to for us to be comfortable to even make this loan. And then even in the future projected sale price, there's more profit. Um, so we are, uh, we're not really worried about the senior debt wiping us out in the situation because we have the ability to force the sale. And if the as is value has enough equity to cover everybody in the capital stack as is, we're, we're pretty comfortable. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's exactly the kind of thinking that you that everybody needs to be doing and also needs to be asking if you don't understand that. Now, where where I would see some risk is let's say that the uh, uh, let's say that the market drops so much. So let let let, let let's say um let's say it was it's a it's a two hundred million dollar apart uh, twelve hundred and fifty 
unit apartment complex, uh, and um, and it was it was you know two hundred million dollars, um, and they were expecting to go up to two hundred fifty million dollars, and and let's say it was one hundred seventy million dollars was the initial um, uh, loan, I guess. What if the property goes down to one hundred seventy one million? Okay, then the senior debt will be taken care of. So the as is today, it might not be there. But I, I actually do ask the question. Um, it's not the actually not the senior debt can wipe us out. It's what if the entire market goes down? So it's not the senior debt wiping us out. And then of course, what if, will insurance cover the TAF equity? You know, an asteroid hits. We have asteroid insurance. Um, is it good enough to cover the senior debt and the mezzanine debt, or is it good enough? You know, for just one of them. And of course, I got preferred equity, so I, I'd have to worry even more. But these are the kind of common sense. And, and so how much training do you need to ask a common sense question? Uh, let me think. None. It's common sense. But you need a license to answer the question properly. I'm just asking the questions. And what if I miss something? Well, you need to hire an attorney, a licensed attorney, a licensed CPA, a licensed financial advisor. It also might give some extra confidence to perform joint deep due diligence with other smart investors like me that have OCD when it comes to these things. And another thing which I which I do is I like to write down in writing with an actual pen, believe it or not, every imaginable scenario that I can lose 100%. And because if if, if those things are really unlikely, it gives me more confidence. So uh, asking other people to join you in the in the deep due diligence, well, you know, we have, we have the Triple D Mindset Club. We have, a, it's a group of investors, independent investors. Each member must be committed to performing deep due diligence. That's only about 5% of us. Most people do not have the patience or mental bandwidth to do it. We are a bunch of critical thinkers. We're open-minded, very cooperative, and we perform joint deep due diligence. And again, these are the criteria that we do, that we use to look at when we do our deep due diligence. The benefits of being part of the Triple D Mindset Club, well, you do joint deep due diligence with these crazy 5%, uh, which includes me. We have high deal flow. We get inner circle treatment at family office club events, and we also have a private forum. We've had, <laughs> right now we've got 46 members, We've had over a thousand posts, I think 1,100 posts since uh, October. Requirements, you have to take uh, my course on best practices and risk management. You have to be an infielder LFI that costs a whopping $395, and you cannot raise capital or provide services to the other members in the group. This is the agenda. We talk about the risk management basics, documentation. We, we actually go through, and this is the hardest part. I mean, if you think it's bad listening to me now in this webinar, imagine listening to me for for six hours, including reviewing 280 risks that appear in 10 PPMs. We go through all of that. And you know, we, we, I talk about deals rejected, which are some of them are amusing, some of them are not. And we then how to access private placement investings and how to, uh, opportunities and, and how to put the whole thing together. So uh, if you want, again, the course, we I, one of the things in the course that I talk about, this is the actual cover slide, is that you know usually it's a uh, High return, high risk, medium return, medium risk, low return, low risk. Then because we can do deep due diligence, that's why we can have high return with medium risk and even a high return with medium low risk. No, but no low risk. There's no high return, low risk. Uh, uh, clients uh, or investors with Tempo Fund get a $300 discount. And uh, you would have to send me uh, an email through somewhere to get that. Uh, we're going to have a part two. Uh, which is going to be reading uh, the PPM and operating agreements. We're going to do a little bit better. Uh, you know, we go more uh, deeper on the parts that we did not cover. That's going to be announced. Deanna and I will figure that out. And if you want to contact me, you can contact me at Mark with a C, that's M A R C, at parttimeinvestors.com. Uh, or you can also contact me at info at nowbehappier.com because I invented the first objective metric for happiness. I didn't know that's what it was, but that's what I did. And I wrote this book that just came out recently called Now Be Happier. Uh, to uh, it's For those of you who like deep due diligence and, and metrics, uh, it's uh, actually, well, I won't go through the whole thing here, but I have on my iPhone an app that actually shows how happy I am and what the opportunities are. So you can you send me an email to info at nowbehappier.com. So with that, it's been exactly uh, the hour. So what I'm going to do, Maybe I'll stop the share and I'll take some uh, questions. Yeah, um, I do have several questions here in the queue. I'm actually going to share my contact information because if there's any questions you have about the Tempo Advantage Fund or Tempo in general, I am here to talk to you. This QR link will take you to schedule a call, um, but you can check out our website anytime. And uh, 
invest at tempofunding.com is the general email. So if you would like to come on the due diligence trip in Indianapolis in June, please reach out ASAP because we're closing registration for that. And um, it's going to be a really great in-depth, deep due diligence field trip, not sponsored by Mark or his team. Um, just want to let you know, Mark will be there, but um, this is really something we do actually um, multiple times a year where we try to get together, let investors come see the investments in person, get to know the sponsor partner that we're working with and ask any questions that are, you know, coming to mind when you're there on the property or just trying to get to know things better about syndications and funds. One of the best things I think I should point out about funds versus syndications is there's not a rush to do your due, due diligence, and there is a window of time where you're not feeling like you're going to miss out as much. So um, that is one of the other great things funds do in, uh, ver versus syndications where they have a closing date and you have to get in as soon as possible. But Mark just demonstrated you could do deep due diligence pretty quick if you are familiar with the language and you have access to people who ask questions, it's not too hard for anyone to do. So want to um, go into the questions with you now. Uh, Dana, if, if it's okay, I actually looking at the question, at, at the questions here, and, and anonymous attendee asked a great, great question. And I, it's it, it, it's really important because it's a, it's a psychological question. And the, as I'm going to read it out here. How do you overcome feeling embarrassed about asking? Okay. Um, I'm afraid that the answer that I want to give is going to make you embarrassed of asking again. But so I'll, I'll give the answer in a second. But um, all I can say is like this: um, just do it. In other words, if you're going to, so it's, the the way to overcome this psychologically is saying, uh, "I'm going to be investing a quarter of a million dollars or uh, fifty thousand. Not in this in this deal, but I typically my checks are typically fifty thousand or a hundred thousand. So when um, when when I write these checks, um, the when if I'm gonna write a check for fifty thousand dollars, that's enough motivation for me to be able to to ask a question. And there really are no stupid questions. Matter of fact, when, when I asked the question of Mike yesterday, it's like, well, wait a second, I'm getting I'm giving a presentation in like twelve hours, and I don't even understand this risk. Now that's embarrassing. So did I get something wrong? Did they get something wrong? Uh, so he, here's my answer. I, 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 I hate giving this answer, but you sort of need to do it. Um, go to YouTube and, and, uh, um, and search for the combination of Bob Newhart and Stop It. Okay, Bob Newhart and Stop It. It's a six minute, 28 second thing. You have to watch it twice. The first time you're going to just crack up laughing. But the second time, you need to pay attention to uh, when Bob Newhart, the psychologist, is convincing this person uh, to uh, to to stop uh, uh, engaging in self-destructive behaviors. So, and I'm not joking. You you should do this. Bob Newhart, stop it. Watch it twice in a row. First time, laugh. Second time, pay attention. So. Uh, the reason why, so were, were, so were you ever uh, at a stage where you felt silly asking expert sponsors your questions? Well, you could probably see that I'm not as introverted as I was when I was a kid. So because I'm now extroverted, I'm, I'm not embarrassed. Um, I, I simply, I don't care what somebody thinks. The sponsor wants 50,000, in this case, quarter of a million, but let's just say 50,000. If a sponsor wants $50,000 of my money, they can answer my question and they want my money. So if I have a, a basic question, no, the answer is no, I don't feel, I don't feel silly asking the, uh, yes, Deanna, maybe you have a better Sorry. answer than I do. Yeah. One little thing I want to even point out our, our minimum investment is actually flexible. So you can even ask that question. Like, is the 250,000 really the minimum or is there any flexibility there? Because I can tell you right now that uh, we do have flexibility on that. So reach out and ask. We are here to answer all of those questions. That, that's a good one. Uh, and in fact, people can also get together and maybe combine to get, be a 250 and create a tribe. There's all kinds of other things uh, there. But uh, that's... Uh, 
Okay, so uh, again, I don't know if I've totally answered, but but uh, uh, watch the Bob Newhart video. Just just do it. I mean, seriously, just just do it. You, you're the one with the money, and you don't have to be a jerk about it. Um, but you know, it is your money, and I, I mean, I don't know about you, but um, I actually, even though I can afford it, I actually still shop gasoline. If if it's three dollars and nineteen cents versus three twenty nine, I'm not embarrassed to just shop gasoline. So. That's for ten cents on on ten gallons. That's a whole dollar. I mean, if I'm if I'm gonna put fifty thousand dollars, I'm not. I, I'm simply not. Gonna, that's that's enough motivation for me to ask a question. Okay, uh, Colette's so asking about deal breakers. Question, yeah, go ahead. The last part of their question says, "Is it a red flag if a sponsor makes you feel like no one asks these detailed questions?" Ooh, that. Uh, let's see. It is a bright, flaming red flag that is on fire and has been consumed. Uh, yes. So uh, in my course, I talk about the uh, characteristics of best in class sponsors. And if a best in class, uh, one of the things that I insist upon every time is I want access to the top people and I want access to the middle people and I want access to the people uh, the, the, on the operations team. And and the reason why I'm going to, um, uh, to Indianapolis for, for this uh, thing, for this uh, event, is I want to meet this guy from Pepper Pike. I haven't met him yet. And um, Paul, I think is his name. So I want to, I want to meet, I want to meet these people. And, but basically if, if, if somebody's, yeah, best in class sponsors love the questions that I ask. And I've, I've asked some questions that just blow them away about, Let's say it was a, it was a fund. It was a triple net lease, light industrial, and I was looking at the at the patents of one of the one of the tenants. Nobody does that, but the best in class sponsors they say that I know it's gonna sound arrogant. The difference between arrogance and confidence is performance, but um, best in class sponsors tell them that I make them better sponsors because of the kind of questions that I ask them. So uh, if 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 a sponsor makes me feel uncomfortable with anything, we're done because there are so many more opportunities out there. And they're competing for our money. So if, if there's anything that I don't like, uh, so there's deal breakers have I encountered in, in PPMs. This, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really great question. Uh, I, I was actually asked that on stage la last week. What are, the, what are, the, what are the, the biggest red flags? And the answer to me is the sponsor must meet all my criteria. So uh, if, they meet, if they fail to meet one of the criteria of best in class, then we're, we're done. Um, but I'm just trying to think in a PPM, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, uh, not necessarily the PPM, but I'll give you an example. Last week we were at uh, BEC and this has nothing to do with, uh, with Tempo Advantage Fund. But so I was looking at, at um, uh, what was it? Uh, 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 mobile home parks, mobile home parks. So, uh, and there were like four or five uh, companies sponsoring mobile home parks and I rejected all of them because they created their equity in the first five years, a phenomenal job of creating equity in the first five years, but they hold on to it for cash flow for 10 years, 15 years. And because I am really, really focused on cash on equity return that hardly anybody ever looks at, um, regular people, then uh, no, if you've created the equity, I want I want the equity, I, I want to redeploy that equity. I don't, I, so, I, and if you go to my my website, uh, parttimeinvestors.com, you can read the blog article I recently wrote about cash on equity return. So there are so many different kinds of deal breakers that um, uh, each 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 one is is different. There's a question for Dana. That's a personal preference. So you, you know you're going to have, you know, the question earlier about the red flag, and if you ask the sponsor the questions and they're giving you pushback, basically that's what I took the question like. But sometimes you got to hear their their tone. So if they're happy, you're asking the hard questions. That's a good thing, but not everybody asks the hard questions. You know, back a few years ago, everybody was winning in all the deals and everything was, you know, uh, okay, take my money. But now there's a lot of questions you need to be asking to protect yourself as an LP. And so they might not be used to having those questions asked. So be very careful going forward is all I'm saying. But in, in your personal um preference, there might be different types of deal breakers. So it might be that person's tone that they push back on you for asking those questions. It might not be something you've encountered in the PPM because your real due diligence shouldn't be just the PPM. It should also be the sponsor. It should also be the project itself. And um, we can go in depth about that, but go ahead. And uh, the next question is, uh, can 
you give a sense of how to find deals and sponsors that Tempo collaborates with. Well, I can tell you, I have um, worked with Tempo now for about a year and a half, and Mike has a very careful, cautious approach at picking sponsors he'll work with. Um, I had worked with other companies in the past that were very open to finding new sponsors to collaborate with, and I wasn't used to the cautious approach that Mike takes. Um, Mike has to know, like, and trust someone for a very long time, has to um, have a good track record and prove that they are capable of executing the business plan. Um, and I don't blame him. There has been times in the past where there's, you know, situations where you try to give that trust to people and um, they, you know, weren't as uh, great of a, you know, partner as you would have hoped just because people change. And um, so it takes time to get to learn their communication style and all of that. Um, someone said, Mark's class is super. It's completely engaging and he is just as funny for the whole day. You will not be bored for a moment. The time flies. I've that, heard that I actually from several people. Um, so I'm, I'm a chemist. Chemists are not funny. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, someone also said... Uh, thank you very much Newark... for that. That's, that, that's very, very nice to hear that. Thank you. Someone also said the Bob Newhart video is exactly on target. So um, probably should go watch that. Um, so what question did we not ask that we should have asked? Kelly uh, asked this question, and I get that I get this question all the time. I want to hear Mark's answer before I give you my answer. Well, uh, so there are, uh, but first of all, I want to commend Kelly for uh, picking up on that in the slide. That's that's really great. Uh, I'm probably going to let you answer because uh, with a, a, asking a deep due diligence person what question was not asked, it's you know uh, how many hours can we sit here. Uh, so obviously there there just just a lot of things that that that, that we didn't do. So uh, I'll answer that uh, uh, Kelly offline, <laughs> and I, I think she said it as a joke, but uh, but I, but it, it is a very good question. And by the way, I ask that question if I'm talking with Comcast or Verizon or I'm in the bank. Um, I always ask that question. I don't care you know what it is. The dentist, uh, I, I'm always asking that question, and you'd be surprised what kind of things you're going to learn. But I mean, there are. Uh, thousands of questions that um that need to be asked but i want so which means for lack of time i'm actually not going to answer that question that's a terrible answer but that's what i'm gonna give deanna what's your answer well it's actually a very simple answer in my experience um everybody's situation is different so you need to ask your cpa what questions you're not asking because they have uh they should be able to advise you as to what is best for your situation and to be able to mitigate tax. And um, that's probably our biggest expense in life. So if if you are uh, tuning in next month, we actually have two CPAs that are coming on um, to talk about tax mitigation and um, what to do, I, I guess, whenever you sell your business or if you are coming into a large sum of money. Um, it's a great opportunity to ask questions live to a CPA in that scenario, but you should definitely talk to someone, uh, a professional about your personal circumstances because everyone's is different and there are questions that will pertain to you, not everybody else's. And we are not licensed to answer those questions. And so that is actually the number one answer I give to people when they say, what question am I not asking? Because I'm I mean, there's a lot of things, uh, like Mark said, that you can go into. What if an asteroid does hit, you know, and, and there's a million questions. We don't know the answer. You can't foresee all of the risks. But um, when you're planning in advance and taking charge of your situation, that's the best you can do. Yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm just going to give a very short answer to the question that wasn't asked, that was just asked uh, about taxes. Um, this is why I invest as much as I possibly can with my self-directed Roth 401k. Uh, the Roth is unbelievable when it comes to taxes, but there's a difference between a self-directed IRA and a, a self-directed Roth IRA and a self-directed Roth 401k that has to do with uh, with uh, UDFI, which again, uh, you don't want to take tax advice from a chemist, but I can tell you that in order for me to be efficient with my time, because 
Uh, so I'm, I'm part-time investors have to be very official with my time, but it also means I have to be official with my money. And since taxes are is one of the biggest uh, bites, uh, you know, biggest expenses, that's why I went with the with a Roth, and then I went with a 401k instead of an IRA, so that I don't have to pay a certain one of the subcategories of UBIT when there's financing. But again, that's a whole other uh, thing. But uh, th that's why you need to talk to to licensed professionals. And I'm not just saying, you know, many times in disclaimers you say, well. Yeah, you know what you're talking about, but uh, we're going to pretend that you that, that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, uh, I sort of pretend that I, I know what I'm talking. That I don't know what I'm talking about, but I don't because I'm not licensed. So you really do need to to uh, consult with professionals. But it really, really helps when you have uh, conservative people like Mike. Uh, and, and with Big Mike, it isn't that he's just conservative. You need to watch some of his uh, his material when he's just talking about macroeconomics he's not even selling any tempo funds or anything. He just has these updates. I don't know, maybe because he lives in New York and it's uh, by osmosis, it's a, it's a local phone call to know everything that's going on in, uh, in, you know, in, in, in wall street. But I mean, Mike really understands that macroeconomics really, really well. And that's one reason why, you know, that, that's one of the many reasons why I, I trust his, uh, his judgments on so many things. Well, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate you coming on and, and doing this. And uh, I know there's a lot going on. You're always busy and this is just a hobby for you. Um, but I really appreciate what you're doing and I'm, I'm excited to have collaborated with you on this. I'm looking forward to part two and uh, digging in deeper. Uh, what is part two going to cover? Um, uh, good question. Part two is going to cover probably other aspects of the PPM that I think might be important. And probably parts of, of the operating agreement, and 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 I'll probably know that in the twenty four hours before we do it, because that's going to be when I'm going to start looking at it, because I'm not looking at it until then, because that's the way that's the way I roll. But it, it and it, you know I, I'm joking, but I'm not joking because we have our lives to live, and somehow we have to fit in this deep due diligence, and so the the fact that I I think it's really important that I that I shared with you that I really did not look at this at, at, at the risk factors until less than 24 hours ago is that, that, that should give you some sort of confidence that it's, it's, it's doable, but I'm also not investing yet. Why? Well, I haven't consulted with my licensed professionals and right now I don't think I have a quarter of a million dollars of, uh, or maybe even a hundred thousand. I don't think I've got a, a dry powder right now. And my wife's in the other room and I need to get her a, authorization you talk about you know conservative de decision making you know i've actually done powerpoint presentations for my wife before investing in private placements and this is after 43 years of marriage and i'm not joking i've actually done that wow well someone else is endorsing you again saying their two sons 16 and 20 years old sat through your entire class on a saturday they took notes and their intention didn't waver for a moment that is impressive. I didn't realize uh, young people were getting to take your course too and actually enjoy it. That's a that's a very big deal. But um, yeah, I was shocked that they that they sat there the whole time. It's amazing. Uh, my ten year old grandson, he just turned ten. He actually took the first three hours of my course, and and I was shocked uh, that that he was able to to do that. Um, and when we got to the part where we, this is the part where we go through a spreadsheet. Um, and I said, okay, this is going to be too complicated for you. And he says, no, because he, he really likes numbers. I almost got to come to the family office club meeting because I really mm -hmm. wanted to meet uh, everybody. But no, he he plays cash flow one on one, beats me. He can find he he has. He, I have a video where he explains three different ways of creatively financing the down payment uh, for a rental when you don't have the the cash. Wow. So uh, yeah, you'd be, you'd be surprised. Uh, uh, kids, kids. In Leah's case, I think they were teenagers. Uh, you'd be surprised what they can comprehend if you simply project to them the uh, the confidence that they can do it. You'd be, you'd, you'd be shocked what, what kids can can pick up. And actually, kids are, might be better at deep due diligence because they don't have that embarrassing part where they say, well, I don't want to ask a stupid question. They just gonna ask the question. And sometimes they're going to ask you a question that's going to really make you think. And you have to go back to the sponsor. So uh, the, yeah, well, the more we discuss these things with intelligent people, the, the, the better it is. And and that's one reason why we so much enjoy being part of the Triple D Mindset Club. It's key that you're actually, what this is saying to me is that um, you don't have to be smarter than a fifth grader. Basically, you can do this 
at any age, almost, as long as you can read and comprehend uh, most words, then you're going to be able to understand this and get through it. And um, that's correct. Help yourself to understand what the risks are. Well, this has been really helpful. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate your time. And I look forward to seeing you in about 45 days on the Indianapolis trip. Um, I want to, um, again, make sure everybody has my contact information. Um, if you would like to join us on the trip, please reach out if you have any questions uh, about the Tempo Advantage Fund or the Tempo Income Fund. I'm also here to answer those questions. Um, but with that, I want to say thank you all for your attendance and participation on this um, Lunch and Learn. And hopefully we'll see you again on May 10th at 12 for the Tax Mitigation Lunch and Learn. Thank you so much, Deanna, for the opportunity to speak to your audience. Thank you. They'll be happier. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.